Hey, so I got this book in the mail the other day. Yes, indeed. Uh, what does it look like? Oh. Yeah, it looks, you know, huh. looks like a video, actually. It does, and why does it look like a video? What's the difference between this and a video, do you think? Actually? Well, that's actually a very good question. Let, let's yeah. talk about how the, how the, the, the video came into being. You were a big factor in that. You know, I, I woke up at meditation one morning and thinking, we should do some dialogues. I mentioned it to you yeah. within a very short time. Presto change, I was like. Presto change, in three or four days, you had it set up. Yeah. We had someone to film the thing, we had a studio to yeah. sit in. Yeah. And the dialogue just happened spontaneously, as the very original first thought had been, the videos happened. It just flowed. It did. It's a flow. It's a flow. Yeah. yeah. And then we started doing those for a while, and it just became automatic. I don't even know how many we've done, but. We're doing one now. Yeah, we're do, um, yeah. like 50. Yeah. yeah. And people seem to like those, but, you know, I'm a text person, to be honest. Like, yeah. I'm a word and text person. So, uh, I think it was Suzanne Winters that suggested that she would transcribe these things and turn them into a book, yeah. right? And I think we were both a little bit skeptical at first. Well, and, I, I and thought, you know, what's, who's going to care? Because the YouTube yeah. videos already exist. Yeah. People can go listen to those. Why would they want to have it written down yeah. to look at in the book? It's already there in videos. Yeah. However, however, it's 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 a completely different device. I've yeah. and we're hearing this from people. Actually, I mean, it's a little bit like saying, "Hey, you know, I have a phone plugged into the wall over there. Whenever I want to use it, I can go and pick up the phone and call somebody. Why would I want a phone that I can carry around?" <laughs> with and the answer is, you don't know until you use it. Actually. You use it. And you uh, can't agree with Yeah, it. and then you can't, and, and, and uh, I was uh, talking with a friend of mine the other day, and I said, look, just take this book and go to it like you go to your phone. Like, most books, we, these days, uh, you know, you probably know, uh, you know, experientially that people are reading less and less. I mean, they're, they're taking in lots and lots of information, they're browsing mm -hmm. a great deal. But in terms of, you know, beginning at the beginning of a book and going to the end of a book, it's not happening very much. No. You've seen the numbers maybe on the Kindle, uh, uh, books where they can see what books have been completed, and many, many of them just never get completed. Um, the good thing about this book is it doesn't need to be completed. You just dip into it. Uh, and so that was not really by design, you know, because we just transcribed it out of our dialogues. But what's beautiful about it is you can just go to it mm -hmm. and be in the middle of something. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we talked about that in Bibliomancy uh, in another video. But it's just the idea that, like, look, there's no beginning and no end. There's and books in here. Right. You just open into it and go to it like your phone. And there's just a paragraph here, paragraph there, and then you move on. Well, and, and I think the books that would have the biggest impact on me have been ones that you could do that with. You could just open them at any place. I am that, which is very mm -hmm. powerful that way. Talk by Ramon Maharshi was very much that way. Even his little pamphlet, Who Am I? You could open it any place and mm -hmm. get something out of it. So. The powerful books seem to be ones you don't have to just start in the beginning and work your way through, but you can just open them anytime, any place, anywhere, and read something. And amazingly, finding with this book, that Van Gogh, one page, has something you can work with. Yeah. And that makes it so much more useful than having to punish yourself for not reading all the way through the thing. Yeah. And there is something different about it, as we're hearing from yes. people, too, than the videos. Is it, I guess it shouldn't surprise us, but we're you know in such a digital moment that we think, like, well, you know, this is one form of the information, with video is another form of the information. They're both information. But the experience you have when you're reading, and the slower, in fact, that you can go, even if you just hop around, yeah. you know, and when you slow down a little bit, it itself starts to create that state that is conducive to dialogue. Because it's almost like, you know, the reader is the third participant right. in the dialogue as they're reading along anticipating what's going to be said and then responding and then yeah. learning to let go of anticipating what's going to be said, I think is really the practice. But that turning over, I think, surprises lots of people. This one faculty member from South uh, Australia has been going through it, uh -huh. and he listened to all the videos. Uh -huh. He's on a retreat right now for about a month. And he said it was amazing when he got the book, put it on his Kindle, looked at it, he said, this is so different from listening to the videos. He listened to all the videos, he thought pretty carefully. He said this is so much deeper, so much more reflective, so much more integrative than just listening to the audio. Yeah. And he was very surprised. Like many people, I was surprised. Yeah. How much bite, you know, how much more feel it has to it, how much texture it has to it, and that you didn't get with the videos. Well what's interesting then is that then one of the teachings that can happen is, is that to just begin to see and experience the distinction 
between these different forms of delivery. Mm -hmm. And that those different forms of delivery have a role mm -hmm. in your practice. That listen to audio, watch videos, but put yourself at stake mm -hmm. in a book. Mm -hmm. And put yourself at stake in a way that does not say, I'm going to read from the very beginning of Crime and Punishment <laughs> to the end, which is a great book. <laughs> but to just dip in and do that little bit of what I've started calling word yoga, yeah. of just really working with that narrative mind. Right? Watch as your mind thinks it's going to be able to fill in the blanks mm -hmm. of what's going to be said, and then see what in fact is said, and learn how to let go of that anticipation. Because that anticipation is something that I mean, we've talked about before, where we can't anticipate anything. What we're going to talk about, how we're going to talk about it, what's going to come out. So if somebody comes into this fascinatingly and tries to understand or try to guess what's going to be said next, they're better than we were, because we didn't know what was going to happen next. And it's just amazing what, how it does unfold. And then you can start to take that release of the anticipation and integrate it into your day so that, you know, you can practice a practice you've talked about a lot, which is, you know, think about, you know, beginning your day, how you think your day is going to go. And then observe your day and see how it does go. And yeah. after a while you start to see what a terrible modeler you are <laughs> of experience. Nothing comes out the way you Right, so what is all this anticipation really doing, but just sort of like creating this frenzy and creating this false sense mm -hmm. of an eye moving through time? It feels like the more we release that sense of expectation, the more the eye itself begins to dwindle, because the eye feels like it very much needs that expectation and anticipation. Something else uh, I've encountered people say, we want to do this ourselves. Yeah, great. I want to, I want to yeah. work, find somebody to work with to do this with yeah. themselves. He said, I don't want to try to find somebody online that I've got to pay. I yeah. said, you know, that really changes yeah. The, yeah. the whole thing. But you've got to find somebody that you can work with. And I said, Rich and I never would have picked each other no. as the person to do this. I know I wouldn't have. You know. I wouldn't have. <laughs> no. And so, but because we're very different people in many ways. But find somebody that you can ask. I mean, what are the important attributes? You have to be able to trust the other person. Mm -hmm. You've got to be open and expose yourself completely to whatever might come up mm -hmm. and just let go into that process. Mm -hmm. And if you can find somebody who will do that with you, you can find out that one plus one can equal five. Yeah. Uh, because we don't know what we don't know. Right. And we certainly don't know what happens when the two of us get together and start having this process. Because it really is a process, as you've emphasized all along. It's a process that you can learn how to do as a development process. Well, what's interesting is, is that as you talk it out and enact that, novelty coming into being. Yeah. It occurs to me, therefore, that even the process of finding someone to engage in this sort mm -hmm. of open-ended dialogue itself requires a sort of surrender to see, like, okay, where, where is this person? It could be anybody. anybody. It could be the person in front of me in line anybody. at the supermarket. It could be somebody, you know, that cuts me off. It could be somebody that, right. you know, says hi to me on the street. Or You don't know. Right. And just Letting go of the expectation that you know who that person would be right. is itself the practice. Absolutely.